It's my tremendous honour to be chairing the Family Office panel for AIM 2019. Uh, this Family Office session will cover some very, very interesting areas that I'm sure you'll find very stimulating and will uh, provoke further debate and discussion after the session. The topic is, of course, uh, investing into the future. There's been a significant increase in the number of family offices uh, globally over the last 10 years, and this trend has continued and is expected to only continue. ENY estimates that there are currently 10,000 single family offices, which is an enormous tenfold increase since 2008, certainly as a result of the financial crisis. But what's even more impressive is the sheer amount uh, being managed by these firms. Uh, just to give an example, uh, I was on a conference call last night with a, a family and they were wanting to invest uh, somewhere around $300 million into a transaction. So if family offices are not on your radar, uh, then perhaps it would be an area to consider further. And these high net worth families have made their presence felt across different sectors, investing and diversifying their portfolio, and in this session, the family offices will discuss the key elements they look for before investing. The purpose of this panel really is due to there being a great mystique uh, and a lack of access and a limited understanding amongst parties seeking private investment, uh, such as project owners, asset managers, governments, promotion agencies, and even other high net worth families on the best manner of connecting with and collaborating with family offices and ultra high net worths to forge long-term relationships in this growing investor sector. The segment of investors are often pivotal in making that earlier stage uh, investment of 1 million, 5 million, 20 million, maybe even 50 to 100 million uh, into profit-driven investments, but also social impact, um, fair trade initiatives and philanthropy to stimulate international economies. Key to this is their participation at an early stage where larger institutional investors um, may not wish to invest, consider the allocation too small, or are not able to foresee the benefits that a family office can. So to answer your burning questions and demystify the world of ultra high net worth family offices, how they invest, what their criteria is, where they're likely to invest into the future, and what you need to do to capture their attention and build a relationship for a mutual win-win, we'll cover several topics. But uh, what I would like to do now is to ask our panellists to kindly uh, enter the stage and we'll, uh, we'll commence the discussions. Firstly, I'll just introduce our distinguished panel. Uh, firstly, to my immediate left is uh, Zulfiqar Garilali. He's the uh, CEO of the Royal Office of Sheikh Tahoun bin Saeed bin Tahoun Al Nayan of the UAE. Uh, next to him is uh, Alexander Kachenko. He's the founder of Ziffer uh, and 2BE from Luxembourg. Just uh, to, to, to his immediate left is Dr. Celeste uh, Loturco, uh, <coughs> former Vice President of, of Strategy of Future Group Holdings in the UAE. <coughs> Mohamed Al Duaj, who's the CEO of the Alea Group of Kuwait. And to, on, on the far end is Sturgios Voskos Poulos, he's the CEO of Canoe Capital Bahrain. Okay. Just to sort of open up the discussion uh, and to give everyone a bit of an understanding of your backgrounds and how you became a family office, um, my first, first question would just maybe 30 seconds to a minute uh, from, from, from each of you from left to right. Um, what was the business sector or investment activity that led your family to evolve into its present structure? How did your family office come into be as it is today? Sure. Um, first of all, uh, good afternoon to everyone here. Rather, I would say good morning, actually. Uh, myself, uh, Zulfakar Gariali, I represent the office of uh, His Highness Sheikh Tanun bin Saeed Al Nahyan. Sheikh Tanun is uh, the grandson of uh, the rural's representative for Alain. 
our job basically yeah the office uh, evolved out of uh, and not out of necessity but but out of uh, commitment to the society at large um the idea of um, the idea that evolved after our deliberate discussion between myself and uh, his ayna sheikh was um, we have to do things which um, add value to the society at large we want to do things and projects and um, uh, focus on ideas which add value to human lives across the world and we invest and we focus on uh, businesses which have been uh, necessity of the recent times for example uh, focusing on climate change focusing on um, creating more and more jobs via tourism investments because this is one of the sectors which can employ a lot of people in a very small period of time at the same time uh, there are se several levels of skills like from highest skill to the most unskilled you can find uh, labor force to have jobs created so that was the main focus and idea and um, <laughs> of course i'm in uh, the initial stages we started off as a typical family office which focuses on bringing in companies to the uae and setting up relationships and um, thereby using their expertise to do projects of interest in the region specific because this is the business and this is the region which we understand the best and then as we grew in confidence we migrated into a full fledged uh, private office and we also carved out a professionally managed um, incorporation which uh, has several offices worldwide uh, through that incorporation we take much more aggressive stance in terms of investing in future technologies like artificial intelligence and uh, augmented reality based projects we have worked on uh, several clean tech technologies and several uh, a futuristic initiatives what we call them as a next practices and uh, as uae wants to focus on a knowledge based economy i think okay. that's what our we are driving as well so in a nutshell that's excellent that's what led us to here yeah. alexander um, we actually started uh, out of business necessity um, about 10 years ago we saw a niche on the market which was not occupied um, uh, the families uh, mainly russian speaking this is uh, uh, our core group uh, were mainly relying on different advisors to manage different pieces of their uh, uh, assets or legal or accounting, and there was no particular center that coordinated it, so we started the, the business together with my wife, and now we're the largest multifamily office for the Russian-speaking customers in Luxembourg. We also have a VC fund, and uh, uh, lately, for the last two years, we've been developing a digital asset marketplace based on uh, security tokens in Luxembourg. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Future Group uh, belong to a Lebanese uh, family, the Magzumi family. And I think it's very interesting how the name is related to the way the family office has been created. Uh, that's actually from the vision of our founder and chairman. Back 33 years ago, uh, believe in his uh, in innovative solution for infrastructure, so the future of the pipes in the infrastructure. And he created uh, a company named Future Pipe Industries, who was uh, producing um, fiberglass pipes. And nowadays, the company produces fiberglass pipes all around the world. Uh, then uh, from there, from one manufacturing company, the well generated has been used in order to create a group active in infrastructure with two engineering companies, one real estate company, one security company, I can go on. Uh, so actually it's been the vision of the chairman that created the family office. And the, despite the fact that the family office became global, both in size, $1 billion, um, and active all around the world. I would say that still has uh, the family insight and leadership. And I think that's one of the challenges when you, became, when you become very big, you look like a multinational company, but actually you are a family office based in Dubai with a strong Lebanese um, uh, leadership. Uh, last things we incorporated in the group was also thinking about how to, be, to give back to the community yes. is, a, is a foundation. And, and just to anticipate potential future question, our idea is exactly this, to be long-term investors 
and wherever we are around the world to give back to the community in terms of transfer of know-how, employment, and I think infrastructure are an easy field to fulfill this second mandate. Thank you. Mohamed? Assalamu alaikum. We are a single family office. We based out of Kuwait and we operate globally. Uh, our wealth came from real estate investment uh, and currently we are doing different line of businesses. We do investment for our own capital into direct real estate and direct private equity. Real estate mainly in Latin America and the Gulf region, private equity, Gulf region and uh, Europe. Uh, the second line of business, we do physical commodity trading from soft corp, which is sugar, wheat, uh, rice, and iron ore and coal. Uh, and uh, we do also business development for companies who want to enter the Gulf region from market research, due diligence, open for them an office here, find for them the right partner, the right cu customers, market research. Uh, the family office, Ali Global Group, was formed in 1998, so it's almost 21 year, years since inception. And I am on board since uh, 2008. Stergios? So yeah, my name is Stergios Voskopoulos. Um, I manage the investment division of uh, one of the largest family business groups in the <coughs> Middle East, YBA Kanu. Uh, that stands for Yusuf Bin Ahmed Kanu, who was the uh, founder of YBA Kanu back in 1890 in Bahrain. So we are about 130 years old group. And uh, the group has grown, I mean, starting from trading in 1890, in parallel with the growth in the region. So Bahrain was back then the hub, the trading hub. Uh, the, the family started from there, from trading, shipping. Uh, when oil was discovered in Bahrain, uh, we started catering uh, the technology and the equipment to the developers, explorers, in 1932. <coughs> and then the family moved to Eastern Province, as uh, oil was discovered also in Jubail, and family members actually became Saudis themselves, and then in the late 60s, family members moved to, the, to Abu Dhabi, and then to Dubai. That's why we have actually three nationality group. We have family members who are Bahrainis, Saudis, and Emiratis. That gives us, uh, that is very competitive uh, for the group in order to become the partner of choice for many international firms. So we are now present in uh, several verticals from uh, oil and gas power machinery to logistics. We were some of the pioneers in the logistics space uh, 80 years ago. Shipping agency, Canoe Travel, one of the largest travel agencies. Real estate, of course, which is uh, one of uh, the main uh, asset bases for most of the family groups in the region. And Canoe Capital is uh, more the asset manager, in, internal asset manager of uh, investments. Yeah. So we have from uh, joint ventures, private equity type of investments to any other asset class. And we are like the liaison between the wealth management and the group. Uh, yeah, th that actually preempts my next growth. question. As a matter of fact, you probably could elaborate upon, how do you, would you actually differentiate between the family business activities and the family investment portfolio. Yeah. Some families uh, in our audience, of course, uh, have very, very heavy uh, business activities uh, and they may outsource that, uh, that function of wealth management. How did you go about that transition, Sturgis? Yes, we are very active also with the business lines from an M&A and uh, business strategy point of view. So as Canoe Capital, we participate in all of these uh, <coughs> executive committees of uh, all the other business lines, but as a group, you know, there is always a, a link amongst all uh, businesses and operations. And then it's, of course, the wealth management as well, right, which is more for the long term and uh, well diversified pool. And Zofiqua as well, how do you differentiate between sort of the family businesses and the family investment portfolio? See, it just uh, stems from the fact uh, as to how they're managed. Most important for us is um, the, the board and the corporate structure in a company. Sometimes we see certain family offices, family-backed businesses, which have a lot of legacy issues with them. And there are certain um, uh, investment portfolios uh, which are extremely <coughs> professionally managed, and uh, they have a good degree of um, uh, due diligence documentation, basically. So that's how we differentiate. I mean... It's more of uh, assumptions and um, 
forecast, which is more of mental and uh, it's more of uh, promoter driven and uh, uh, it's one man's vision at the end of the day. So of course. We, we, that's how we look at things. I mean, and sometimes not, I'm not saying they're wrong or they're right. It's just that you have to have alignment with your own vision and where you see yourself along with them in next uh, foreseeable future. So that's how we differentiate between them. Any other speakers? Any comments? Or if I... Yes, I think that uh, one of the major challenges for uh, family office, and maybe Mohammed can support me in this, of this part of the world is the division of actually the family office activity and mm -hmm. the corporate activity. So for us, in my journey with the group in the past seven years, that has been a long process that brought to a change in the structure with a clear definition what is family related and what is corporate related. And that went with the enlargement of the group globally, where there was even more necessity to have a clear division. And one of the examples is that, of course, in a family office, normally you have one decision maker. And for us now, for investment, we have an investment committee. Then we have the board. <coughs> so even in the investment, uh, uh, this, let's say, related activity, we create the guidelines, we create a structure in order to have a self-standing uh, corporate structure, the non-necessary relate uh, directly in every uh, step to the family or to the decision maker. Indeed, indeed. Well, look, uh, and what, what we want to now drill down more so for the benefit of our, our audience is the essence of your family's investment philosophy and how you actually execute those investment uh, objectives for both wealth preservation and future growth, which the, the topic of the panel is actually uh, future growth. So, um, Zofiqwa, I mean, presently, what are some sort of key investment categories, sectors, assets which comprise your portfolio? And what was the decision-making process and reasoning for this? Like, and what is the sort of the risk profile you look at and are targeting, and, and, and why is that? Sure, I mean, it's, a, it's a very comprehensive question that you ask. Uh, it's got three layers to it. Uh, first and foremost, uh, our investments, if you look at uh, in past uh, three years, I would say, it has been absolutely, uh, I would not say they were risk averse, but they were in the sectors where we believed, um, you know, this is where the future is going to be. Uh, we never went ahead and bought uh, those trophy assets, you know, we never went and bought, uh, well, I'm going to go to New York and buy the Rockefeller Center and I'm going to put in my $2 billion for doing that. I'm not interested in working on those. It's, it's a job of a lazy CEO, according to me. Just take all the money and go and buy one trophy asset somewhere in Europe or somewhere in the US and then you're sorted and that's it, you sit on it for, and if it works, it works for you. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. I never did that in my entire career so far of 13 years. Um, what I've done is, um, I have, last year I've traveled almost 22 times to the US and uh, even the Europe and in India and the startup hub called Bangalore. And you won't believe some of the investment that we made was as small as uh, $200,000. And we're sitting on a valuation of those uh, tech <coughs> projects and those companies at a minimum to two, two to three hundred million dollars to almost a couple of billion dollars. So this is where our, uh, our vision has been moving. And the reason for this has been that we don't want to concentrate all our money into one asset class or we don't want to be focused only on one particular market or geography. And at the same time, we are not um, the sovereign wealth fund that who will have access to billions and billions of dollars. We are just a small private office which works within its limitations. So whatever monies we are earning, it goes back into investments, it's rolled in. Um, so we also have to look at uh, how do we classify or you know segregate our investment. We're sector agnostic. I mean, there can be a beautiful real estate opportunity which I, which I would definitely look at as well. But predominantly, we don't look at just going into concentrating all the wealth into one basket and rightly because of the market situations. Certainly. Yeah. Alexander? Um, typically, the uh, family offices or the, uh, the families from the former Soviet Union are mostly concerned about the wealth preservation. So the, um, the biggest amount of capital goes to the really secure investments. We are very much focused on the early stage investments or alternative asset classes. So we are responsible for the growth. 
so we have an early stage fund which invests into pre-seed, seed, A level, and B level. And we really go in uh, at the level of the angel investment. So we really work with the best angels in the UK, Europe, and um, uh, uh, Southeast Asia to get those deals. It becomes more and more difficult to get those uh, assets at the A level and almost impossible to get at B level. Uh, we also focus on the new assets such as cryptocurrencies, blockchain. So we're really, really focused on the growth as, as a family office. Uh, so I will um, uh, take two different data. The one I found in the, one of the latest research on family office that actually sees how mainly family office look at preserving 32% of the global family office. 45% look at uh, balanced preservation of capital, and only 23% look at growth. So these are the data, to be fair. But my perception, especially in this part of the world, is that the risk-adverse attitude and the um, predominantly attitude to preserve capital has changed. And of course, I would say change even dramatically after the 2014 oil price. There's a need to look for yield, for a turn. So uh, we look at growth. There are many opportunities. And I would say that there is a tendency, a new tendency. Maybe my co panelists from this part of the world can, can support this in looking uh, a little bit out of the boxes. And for the out of the boxes, not something so innovative, it could be VC and blockchain, but something different from what is our core business. Even us, we are in infrastructure, but we are happy opportunistically to look at something different. And I think that overall, the family offices at GCC that mainly are in automotive, real estate, started becoming on one side more sophisticated, so able to understand different sectors, but as well having an interest for look a little bit more at grow. Yeah, Mohammed? In my opinion, in this region, uh, there's two type of family offices. One are conventional, they, want the, they, they are really happy with their comfort zone, they want to invest into something they already investing in, and they don't want to go outside the box. And the second uh, type of family offices, they are risk taker. They love challenges, they love to explore new market, new investment opportunity. If they got a sexy investment idea, they will go w with it. They will not hesitate to invest, even if they are not 100% comfortable with it, they will go ahead just to try it and they will, they will bet uh, on, on their money with it. Also in this part of the world, uh, I'm talking about even myself, like the emotional part take a large part in uh, taking the investment decision. If I meet a, a team of, uh, of people who has investment opportunity and they really feel emotional, I like the way they present it, I feel like there is a friendly in the way they present it, I would put my money with them. Some people, like they got to my office, uh, they have like very interesting investment opportunity, low risk, uh, and I am really comfortable with it, but I feel really hesitant to invest with them because I don't feel comfortable. They are so pushy or they are not friendly enough to get my confidence. Stergios? I will agree Your with Mohammed actually that decision making. Yes, about the two types also family offices, which is the risk takers and uh, the more conservative or being their safety zone. We're trying to be both, right? So at the end of the day, it's about risk and return. And it's about uh, diversification. Uh, it's the three dimensional, as I call it, which is growth, yield, but also liquidity. So we're trying to balance this uh, from an <coughs> asset management perspective, having our internal governance, internal criteria. We have our investment policy statement in place. I mean, that's, uh, we are all on the, on the same uh, page from the team to the investment committee, to the board, to the shareholders. So first you need to have a vision where you want to get. At the same time, you can be always opportunistic, but opportunistic within the constraints that you have already set. Otherwise, uh, as Mohammed said, you know, we are receiving so many opportunities every day and our asset is our time also. So we have uh, the presence in the region, we have the family members who are all there to support, we have uh, management teams, but also we have our precious asset, which is time and, uh, you know, control of our time. Therefore, you need to know where you want to head. Uh, diversification is key, uh, preservation is key, downside protection. Uh, you cannot have 
all your money into the same pool. Uh, we do support the region. We are one group that has 5,000 employees. We support across these three countries uh, labor and innovation. But we are looking also outside. And many times, you know, a successful model <coughs> for the Canoe Group is partner with uh, international firms that we can bring to the region. That's why, you know, we are the partner of AXA, of Halliburton, of AXA yeah, a strong Nobel, local partner Maersk, for them yeah. to represent their interests. Okay, uh, going on to the next one, we'll probably have to limit it to, to sort of about two speakers. Which jurisdictions and structures have either been effective for you or you would recommend to others to consider when it comes to taxation, succession planning, asset protection, privacy, to best serve the long-term objectives. Why don't I leave that one with you to start with, Alexander, because you're very much an MFO that look at this every day. Um, here, we've seen a tectonic change in the uh, structures in terms of the attitude to the wealth um, uh, in Europe specifically. Uh, if um, as long as six, seven years ago, uh, it was reasonably comfortable to do business, it's becoming extremely difficult to do business in di different jurisdictions. It's almost impossible. It's almost a fight to open a bank account in a European bank. And the KYC procedures uh, for moving even the slightest amounts of money between different banks, even within the same regions, are very, very difficult. So what we see is a dramatic shift of uh, uh, the structures to onshore structures. Uh, introduction of the CRS uh, compliance, and this is probably a specific um, European uh, subject, but what we see is that <coughs> transparency is becoming almost uh, an obsession. So you see the registry of the beneficiaries appearing, etc., etc. And again, I'm not against the tax abiding objective per se, but only 60 years ago in that specific region, uh, Europe, you could be killed for being a particular nationality, let alone, you know, full transparency. And in Italy, you know, as, as, as late in the 70s and in Germany, uh, same in the 70s, people were abducted for being very rich. Therefore, this is a very, very scary development for very, very wealthy families. Um, the, um, an, another scary development is the general shift of the attitude. You are suspected to be uh, by definition of being wealthy, uh, being on the wrong side. So um, this is actually a very, very difficult, from my point of view, times uh, for the, that particular European region. You know, wealth generation is a very, very important factor. Capital is a very, very important factor. If you're starting to scare it away, then it will move. It will move to Asia. It, mo it will move to the Middle East. So... Uh, in short, to summarize, it's very difficult to do uh, banking relationships, even for the customers who've been with the banks for a long <laughs> period of time. We see a dramatic shift to onshore. Luckily for us in Luxembourg, Luxembourg is one of the beneficiaries of that shift. So dramatic cut of the offshore jurisdictions lead to a uh, big move. Tied up in a second. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, so that, that's, that's basically what we see. And then we see uh, increased scrutiny to the wealth. Okay, I'll, I'll direct this one more directly to uh, Mohammed. I mean, what, um, does entrepreneurship still play an important role for your family office or amongst your uh, next generation family members? Um, or is there more of a focus on investment management? I mean, how would you differentiate the two? Sorry, can you elaborate more? Entrepreneurship, what is the role of entrepreneurship in your family office in comparison to um, okay, uh, wealth preservation? My family, like, before, before I start running the family office in 2008, it was mainly focused on uh, investing its own capital into real estate in the Gulf region and uh, private equity in the Gulf region and Europe. And since I took on board, I integrated new business uh, lines into the, bus uh, into, into the group. Fairs like business development, uh, the physical commodity trading, being a mediator, and many other, uh, other stuff. So we are into, uh, into like, new stuff when it comes to our, our new group. Okay, and, um, and which investment uh, categories or sectors do you prefer to engage external advisors, third-party asset managers in order to leverage their expertise, research, economies of scale, etc.? I'll we put this out to one person on the panel. 
we don't engage in external advisor. For us, whenever we, we believe like into a new market or a new segment that we want to invest our money in, we go and do our, the homework by ourselves that because we take it as a learning lesson. If we just like sit in our office and place our money here and there, that would that mean we are gaining nothing. We're just gaining the return, but we don't get the experience. We don't get yes. the knowledge. So let me give you an example. Before, three years ago, we had like an interest to invest into greenhouses in Mexico. For me, I went there three times just to meet the government authorities, the lawyers, to understand the taxation process, meet other family offices, to understand how we can go and co-invest with them and see some investment opportunity. And at the end, we decided not to invest because it was uh, risky, risky for us. If we hire like an external advisor and we just tell him, okay, we want to invest or place X amount of money in, in Mexico, they will do it, but we will gain nothing. And we will not know the real risk. And Zalfikwa, I mean, what is your uh, view on uh, when you're engaging external asset managers to maybe leverage upon their expertise? Uh, predominantly, I mean, um, the family office I represent, it's a royal family, so uh, we are blessed with a real and a direct deal flow. And most of the times, because we are not just a business family, but also a, a diplomatically engaged family, we have deal flow at the highest level. Most of the time, it's coming from directly from the government sources. So as you mentioned, Mohammed, about uh, Mexico, uh, when we gave in to Mexico, we were directly sitting with uh, the new president, Mr. Amlo, and um, the Club de Industrial, which is the main body which focuses on trade and business development. Just to give an example, since you quoted Mexico, and very next hour, I'm sitting with Mr. Carlos Slim and trying to look at several deals in that country and how we can achieve several certain projects, how we can get sovereign guarantees and how we can work. So there are a lot of family offices who actually engage with us because we can help them open up a much, much larger portfolio and much bigger and secure better guarantees from that country as such. So um, answering the question, do we deal with asset managers? Sometimes there are some asset managers who will bring us a deal flow. But predominantly, we are blessed in one thing that uh, we have an excellent high quality deal flow because of the family office that we belong to. Yes. And uh, right. on the other hand, uh, there are really high quality asset managers who bring in seriously good quality projects, but it's a mix of 80 20, I would say. Okay, um, and I'll direct this to, uh, directly towards uh, Celeste, as you're, you're probably the expert in this area. Like, separate from pure investment objectives, how are the, fa the family looking at socially responsible objectives uh, for their succession planning, social impact, sustainable development, and philanthropy? Uh, and other areas uniquely important to the family considered um, and agreed upon. Like, how do you go about this? What's the decision making process and how is it structured? Well, when the, um, the group started, it was uh, through a foundation. So I would say that whatever we, nowadays would be considered as an impact <coughs> investment, a sustainable investment, uh, was much more philanthropy, pure philanthropy. And that's why we created a foundation, the Magzumi Foundation in Lebanon. Of course, being a Lebanese family office, the idea was to give back to the community in Lebanon. Uh, but that itself, the activity of the foundation moved from philanthropy into impact investment. So giving still back to the community at the domestic scale and lately at the global scale in a different way. Just to give you a few examples. Starting in uh, supporting education, and then uh, supporting um, vocational training, and then going into microcredit. The idea is to provide people with uh, skills, and then eventually with the financial, in order to be independent. So that was a big step, not just donation or pure charity, but trying to empower um, People in that case was mainly women. We know that microcredit always it's very uh, targeting. It's mostly targeting women, uh, and then we enlarged the scale because we became global. So we did this through in three different ways. The first one, of course, was through corporate social responsibility. So we create an internal department, and it's very challenging when you have and you reach more or less all the globe and you have 33 different nationalities with different kind of requirements, necessity, culture, and religions. Um, as well, we change the way we do things internally. I think it's very important when you want to have an impact to invest in a sustainable way, but as well to do things in a different way internally. 
So we change our internal way of doing things. And thirdly, when I say we, we, we look at uh, double or triple bottom line in our investments, of course, we need infrastructure is slightly easier in the sense that we are mainly in the water, we are looking at renewable, we are in the oil and gas, but also looking at all this traditional sector, we look how this traditional sector can evolve. So in a way, we haven't been able, I would say, to match sustainability with profitability, because even if you are in traditional sectors, if you look where the evolution or disruption is going to go, and you can anticipate this, you look, work for the sustainable uh, solution, but as well can be the profitable one, uh, the profitable one on the long term. And, uh, and, and carrying on with you just uh, there, Celeste, uh, you've got the advantage of also having engagements in the sovereign wealth fund area, in, in, in addition to uh, being a, a family office. So what do you perceive, um, uh, you know, from your perspective, and this is to, to cover the area of you know, future growth and future trends, um, what are your perspectives on the future trends that will impact family offices and your family office over the next five to ten years? Yes, so I had the opportunity to, and I have the opportunity now to wear two hats. And so as a sorrow fund expert, I would say actually <coughs> we can see very similar trends in the, in the future. Uh, both sorrow funds and family office became much more sophisticated, much more global. But what is very interesting, looking specifically at several funds, that for sure the future is in the alternatives. That was already evident in 2015, when uh, up to 42% of the global allocation of portfolio several funds was into alternatives, real estate, infrastructure, private equity. Mm -hmm. uh, but nowadays there is a specific interest, increasing interest in VC. And looking just few numbers, if in 2009 till 2013 several funds invested in VC up to $84 million, and mainly two, Temasek and GSC, from 2013 to 2018, the overall amount invested was $5.5 billion, and the several funds investing were 17. So making an analogies with private family office globally, not only of this region, uh, the space for VC, venture capital, including blockchain, or the application of new technologies to traditional sector, it's predominantly. So I see this as a very strong future trend, backed by research and data. And uh, also for us, they are in a very traditional sectors, like the infrastructure one. We are um, eager so, so yeah. to see uh, um, how the innovative solution can support traditional sector. That's it. Okay, excellent. And uh, Sturgio, so I'll, I'll put the same question. I mean, what are your perspectives on future trends that will impact family offices and your family office in the coming five to ten years? The, the trend that we see is that as family businesses, you we still focus on your operations and what uh, has uh, made these families grow. But also you have to be more proactive, so you need to insource skill set and uh, management in order together with the families to grow and uh, be more proactive in the market you know, in terms of deploying, in terms of sourcing and deploying assets instead of just relying on uh, external managers. So I see the emerging trend in the family businesses globally where they are more proactive and they can do things more directly and by co-investing and bringing in skill set in order to be able to do more in terms of asset management and diversification. And also families interacting uh, um, between different geographies. Mohammed, uh, your thoughts on that? You're obviously a, a very active direct investor. What are your thoughts on the future trends uh, going forward for your family and family offices in general over the coming five to ten years? I think the, <coughs> I think the future for family offices in the Gulf region, since I belong uh, from here, they will do more co-investment uh, together because uh, now the market like really, really need to join like forces when it comes to financial and also knowledge. So people are more into that, especially from Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, uh, UAE, and the rest of the Gulf. Uh, rest of the Gulf. 
maybe they will enter a new market like I see like uh, a lot of families now they're going abroad out of the box to Latin America to Russia to Australia and they have a lot of investments into new new in sectors like agriculture uh, hospitality uh, infrastructure uh, also like in Africa I was in Africa last last month and they've seen many of the fam not many but I say a number a number of families from the Gulf region on an individual basis, not, on, not supported by the government, they enter that market and take the risk, which is, for me, su surprising. So I think that going forward, it will be expanding more. Okay. And in, in 30 seconds, this is for all panelists, so limited to 30 seconds, please, okay. As a special insight, just as a, as, as a gift to our audience here uh, for AIM Congress 2019, if you had to pick one or maximum two investments or sectors in any geographic location in the world um, that you feel could be most successful, what investment sector or opportunity would that be? Which geographic <coughs> location? And what is your reason for wanting to invest in this? So your hot tip for all of our AIM Congress members in 30 seconds. Uh, it's been very basic for us since past two years. It's uh, all about uh, security and very high precision security apparatus. So we have invested very recently in um, smart road concepts and uh, safe uh, community sec and also several uh, drone projects which uh, helps secure the community and secure the world in general. We've been working on a lot of autonomous um, armed vehicles as well as for civilian purposes, the autonomous vehicles. Uh, that's where the future trend also we think is going to be. And we are also focusing on um, creating more and more uh, agriculture and agricultural tech. Um, we recently acquired a fertilizer and a mining company out of Canada. So this is what we are focusing on right now. Thank you, uh, Alexander. We consider blockchain as a new technological revolution. So the first one being internet, second one being uh, mobile, and now blockchain. We believe that this technology will rev revolutionize the world uh, as we see it. We're at a very, very early stages of its development, comparable to something like 93, 94 in the Silicon Valley. Um, and we believe that this is one of the pillars of the uh, future world technological development. The others being uh, big data analysis and artificial intelligence. So we strongly believe in the technology and more specifically in the blockchain. Celeste, 30 seconds. Yeah, preservation, so infrastructure in places where there's a need of rebuild and non-necessary place that are already developed, so difficult one. And uh, in terms of opportunistically, I would look for BC and uh, innovative solution for traditional sector. Mohammed, in 30 seconds. For us, we believe totally in agriculture because people always eat and there's a huge demand for it during the war, peace, recession. Um, there is always a high demand for that. So for us, we're always uh, investing into agriculture and we encourage other people, if they ask us for our advice, to invest into agriculture worldwide. For us, is, uh, I'll talk about mainly three themes, which is uh, the recreation of existing businesses through technology and digitalization, like logistics, for example. Sustainability, you have to invest and uh, you know, cultivate sustainable business models, otherwise uh, it's very opportunistic. And third is Asia, I still believe in Asia, that uh, that's the engine of growth that also drives the Western markets. And Africa, of course. I mean, okay, um, I, we've probably got one to two minutes left. Uh, one minute less. One minute, are there any burning questions? The gentleman in the front, could you please get this gentleman a mic? The gentleman is asking if you couldn't hear about funds, if they invest in funds and its impact for Sharia compliance. So I'll, I'll answer this for you. Um, we've been, we've, of course, we've burned hands going into blind pool with funds, but recently we also looked at a very aggressive um, and a very transparent team which uh, was focusing on uh, technology investment, which we understand the best. So we just uh, join hands with them. Uh, but our sweet spot is always the co-investment. Um, like, show me a deal and let's go together <coughs> into it. Even if you bring in the smallest of the amounts, it's fine as a fun, but let's do it together. That's an idea. 
talking about Sharia compliant, uh, we are in the process of uh, launching a Sharia compliant mutual fund very soon, predominantly with one of the largest brands in the world, which is focusing now to enter into the UAE and the GCC market. So to answer that, that's what we're looking at, yes. Have we got time for one more? One more? Is there any, any burning questions for our audience? Okay. Now, I, th I think that, that, that will be time's up, ladies and gentlemen. We'll look at, just in conclusion, um, uh, if you wish to speak to with any of the panelists, I've, I've spoken with them. Uh, they'll be um, around uh, later around the lunchtime area, so uh, in the bubble lounge. So if you wish to approach any of the speakers on this panel and discuss things further privately, you're certainly welcome to do so. So uh, it's certainly been an honor from my side. I thank my uh, distinguished panelists for giving their valuable insights and uh, our audience here at AIM. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.